Okay, I'm delighted to be joined by Stephen Young, who is the Executive Director for Growth, Environment, Transport and Community Services at Lancashire County Council. More importantly for today's conversation, a huge Burnley Football Club fan. Stephen, welcome. Yeah, welcome Frank. Hi, how are you? I'm good, mate. I'm good. And, and like all football fans, um, looking forward to the new season perhaps with not quite as much anticipation because, of course, we're still not able to get into the the stadia. But nonetheless, uh, any new season, uh, we all start with hopes and dreams. Uh, whoever you support, that's the case. And Burnley have had a phenomenally successful uh, history in recent times. Leadership, of course, under the management of Sean Dyche. Um, but how did you get into supporting uh, the Clarets. Uh, what what was the, what's the, the the story behind that, mate? So I I, I was born in Wigan, so I'm not, I'm not actually born in Burnley. So I was born in Wigan, and then we as a family moved overseas, and we lived um, in the Caribbean, interestingly enough. So where they play a lot of cricket and didn't really particularly play football. Um, we then came back to England in the early '80s, so I had no affiliation with football at all uh, at that particular point. Uh, and we moved near Burnley and my dad took me once um, to a Burnley game. I didn't really know what to expect. Um, and I went and it was a night game against um, Sheffield Wednesday. And I remember walking up the, the steps into the, into the stand and just seeing this floodlit pitch. And it was just the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Uh, and I've been hooked ever since. So that was 1981. Uh, and I've been watching them home and away ever since. And I suppose a number of things capture you, don't they, when you first go to uh, the match? But under the floodlights, those old traditional stadia, such as Turf Moor, do have a special feel about them, don't they? So I'm sure that uh, was one of the reasons why you thought, wow, this is just fantastic. It was the noise, it was the, it was the singing, it was the chanting, it was the smell, it was just the excitement, you know, when they nearly scored and when they did score, and it was just everything about it, it was that whole kind of tribal atmosphere, it was just the most amazing thing I think I've ever seen, uh, and you know, and I can still remember it even now, and I remember walking up just as a, as a really small boy, kind of coming up the steps, and you sort of see more and more of the pitch as you walk up, and it was just, just an amazing, amazing night. Uh, and during that period of time, so it was the early 80s, did you say, Stephen? 81, yeah? that was, yeah. yeah. Who, who were the sort of uh, star players at that time? Who were your favourites? So we had people like Billy Hamilton uh, was uh, an amazing player uh, that we had. I mean, just a bit later than that, Roger Hamsbury, the goalkeeper, was, was a great player. I mean, at the time, unfortunately, I kind of joined Burnley as they were starting their decline um, down into 87 when we nearly went out of the league. And we had to beat Orient on the last day to survive, which we did. And then uh, for me, the, the, the Halcyon days was just after that, kind of 88, 89, 90, 91. People like George Agarney, P Peter Leebrook, I mean, not household names to people outside of Burnley but those were kind of the players that we had you know from 87 nearly going out of the league and 88 we got to the Sherpa Van final went had a day out at Wembley 80,000 people there you know it was amazing and, the, and these players you know were part of the of the the fabric of, of Burnley were part of the community. Now, unfortunately, you know, all the players that Burnley have all live out in Audley Edge. You know, they're not really connected to the town. But you used to see these players around the town. I mean, I was at school at the time. So, you know, when we were out at lunchtime in Burnley Town Centre, you'd, you'd bump into these players and these guys were like heroes, you know. And I went home and away in the fourth division back in the day. And every season, this was going to be our year to get promoted. And every year it didn't happen. And <laughs> leading up to 92, when eventually they did it, um, and went, we went to York um, for a midweek game and we, we beat York 2-1 and that sealed our promotion. It, it was an incredible decline in some respects because, you know, my uh, first memories of uh, Burnley, and you would never guess this, Stephen, but I'm slightly older than you. Um, <laughs> are from the uh, the seventies, when of course you had players like Steve Kinden, I remember, and uh, Martin Dobson, who signed for Everton for a huge fee at the time, three hundred thousand pounds. Brian Flynn, you know, some really great, great players. Uh, and I think I'm right in saying it was the owner at the time was a, was a local entrepreneur, Bob Lord. Yeah, Just Bob Lord. Yeah. Um, and I remember Bob Lord was was often, you know, on, on the television, on the, the sort of football programmes, talking about his love of the club, but also, you know, it was the days when if you had somebody of that ilk, um, then you had a few bob to spend. And what Burnley always appeared to be really good at during that period, Stephen, was 
developing players and then selling them on for big profits. Uh, and certainly, as I say, that's what happened with, with Martin Dobson for sure, but many others as well. Before your time, as I say, but I'm sure they're the sort of stories and tales that, you know, the old Burnley supporters still talk about today. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I've recently read the um, the um, biography of Bob Lord, which is a really, really interesting read. It sort of talks about his time with the club and he was a local entrepreneur, and he, you know, and he took the club to a league championship, you know, got to the FA Cup final. Um, so did some amazing things. But Burnley, just by the size and scale of the town, has always been a selling club, you know, and, and he traded for years and years and years on some of those talents that you mentioned, was able to sell them and just keep the club going, just keep the club going. Unfortunately for, for Bob Lord, eventually it just caught up with him um you know and you know we sold one too many players we brought players in who weren't good enough and and the decline started and sadly it kind of the decline of the football club happened at the same time as the decline of his health uh, unfortunately when he died lots of questions were subsequently left around his handling of the club his management of the club i mean i did didn't live through all that but when i look back at the book and you know the stories that i've been told to some extent i, I hold him in, in similar regard as as the current owners you know they are not multi-billionaires that they are trying to punch with the Everton's, the Manchester United's, the Manchester City's, the Tottenham's, the Arsenal's of this world. You know, we are a small town of 80,000 people. You know, we're never going to be able to pay the salaries that others can pay. We can't pay the transfer fees. So you've got to try and, you know, do the best with what you've got. And, you know, and at one point the club eventually will get caught up and we will get relegated, but it's a great ride whilst we're on it. Mm. And of course, when you talk about you know, those good times, Burnley were definitely the premier club in Lancashire at that uh, during that period for a long period of time actually. Um, now you know no one feels more keenly uh, the bitter rivalry and the abject despondency that you have when your nearest rivals are doing well. And of course, whilst Burnley went through that dip, you then had Jack Walker, another entrepreneur, of course, another Lancashire entrepreneur who uh, took over at Blackburn Rovers and they go on to win the Premier League, which was just incredible. Um, and people said it never happened again. I suppose Leicester City uh, fall into that category to an extent, but Blackburn, an even smaller town, well, a much smaller town than Leicester. Uh, and of course, uh, for Burnley supporters, that must have just been agony at the time. It was. It, it was really bittersweet. I mean, certainly when I going back even further than that, when I was at school, we were always in the fourth division. They were in the old second division, so they always always had you know one over us. And every time we odd, you know, when we got them in the cups, they'd always beat us. We played them pre season, they'd always beat us, and it was kind of a very difficult kind of period to know that you never could quite lay a glove on them. I suppose when they won the league, you know, f f to be fair for Blackburn and for Lancashire, it was it was a great achievement. And I take nothing away, but as a Burnley fan, it was a particular low point. It was a really difficult season actually because if you recall it was between them and Manchester United and it was one of those where I was just thinking we need to declare war on somebody to get the whole thing null and void because whoever wins this is not going to be great but it is interesting really because that was almost the the, the, the the start of the decline for them so the season after that they got into the Champions League and, and they were terrible if you recall two of the players had a punch up in a, in a game in, in, in Moscow um, and then from that it was, it's was it been a very slow decline and although they, they always kind of had the the the, the handovers for a number of years um, after that with Sean Dash arriving I mean it's completely flipped around and you know to wait all those years to finally beat them uh, and then when we finally did beat them at Ewood Park and then we've beaten them again at Turf Moor and beaten them twice more I think since then in, in the leagues and another time in the Cups you know it, it, it's been amazing to see and, and it, it absolutely was worth the wait. <laughs> yeah, it's always good when you bounce back, that's for sure. Mm. Uh, and, and so you've mentioned uh, Daishi there, and he's been an absolute revelation uh, for the club. And I'm sure that on more than one occasion, you've feared that he may be getting an offer from a, a bigger uh, club, a bigger team uh, in the Premier League. But he's still there. He's going to be there for the foreseeable by the looks of it. Um, tell us about the journey under Sean Daishi's leadership. Well, it's a really interesting one. So prior to Sean Dash, we had, it, had, it, had Eddie Howe who joined the club. And to be fair, I thought with Eddie, I thought he's the sort of manager we want. You know, young, he'd done well at Bournemouth. I thought he could really kick us on. He did it. He did it. He did a decent job, but it didn't quite work for him. Uh, and then Sean Dash was appointed. And I'll be honest, I, you know, I don't think anyone was calling for Sean to, to, to be appointed at the time including me. Um, he took over halfway through a season and it was, you know, the season was petering out. 
obviously inherited the players that he had. It wasn't a great finish to the season. I'll be brutally honest with you. I, I could have quite happily uh, parted ways with him in that summer. Um, we started the season after with Sean and obviously he'd had a summer then to put his own ideas into play. Um, we were um, second favourites to be relegated. So we had like, you know, rich clubs in the division at the time, like QPR, who'd spent a fortune getting Joey Barton, people like that. You know, we just thought, well, you know, they're going to run away with it. We set off really well um, behind Leicester. And then you were just kind of thinking the bubble's going to burst, the bubble's going to burst. They kept going and going and going and eventually were promoted in second place, um, which was just amazing. First season back in the Premiership, unfortunately, we were relegated, kept with Sean, we won the Championship. And then since then, it's been amazing. I mean, for a club like Burnley to get into Europe and then last year just be on the on the cusp of Europe, you know, we've run away at, we've run away at Everton, I remember winning there once. We won away at Old Trafford. You know, to, to see a club like of our stature to do that and then Sean has had to sell so many resources and then it just seems to be able to pick other people who could come in. Um, so, you know, for, for me, he is the best manager I've ever seen at Burnley and we have played the best football I've ever seen in, in the 30-odd years I've watched them. Mm. And it's a place that no club enjoys going to and you can't play a greater compliment, really. Uh, to a club such as Burnley than that, can you? You know, you, you don't see any of the clubs, whether it be a Liverpool, a Tottenham, a Manchester City, whose players look as though they're really looking forward to the game at Turf Moor. I mean, it's, it's a difficult place to come to, isn't it? You know, it's 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 often wet, it's often cold, it's quite it's quite condensed in terms of the crowds, quite close to the pitch. And all the clubs that you've mentioned there, they've all come to play us in the in the league, and we've beaten them all at some point, you know, over the time. You know, it's not an easy place to come. It's no respecter of reputations. You know, Sean Dyche will always prepare a side that will work incredibly hard and is really well organised and you know and he's proven that time and time again I think the only thing I think that kind of goes against Sean which I think is a really good thing for us is that people uh, he's kind of fallen into that Sam Allardyce mode where people think he's a long ball mm -hmm. footballer you know he's a long ball manager he's got old uh, he's got really old certain kind of ideas but if you've watched them week in week out you know we do play some nice football he is all over the, the data and the statistics you know around his players you know he's all about bringing players into a part of the group I think he's a really modern manager and, and you know a long may it continue that people think he's old school because then nobody will come in and take him from us yeah yeah and, and I think Allardyce often uh, bemoans the fact doesn't he he says you know if my name was Sam Allardyce I don't know I, I won't even try and pronounce the name he used but you know if he was a foreign manager basically he says I'd have been offered much bigger jobs uh, and you know I've spoken to Michael Finnegan who worked very closely with Allardyce for a number of years who tells me that he was one of the most innovative football managers and one of the best leaders that he's ever worked alongside and I get the impression with Sean Dyche in terms of his players they're motivated, they're well prepared, they're well drilled, they know what the job is and that basically is a really good football manager and you know you could give your eye teeth to many clubs as, as you say Steve and a possibly considered bigger uh, than Burnley who have been searching for that sort of leadership, Everton being one of them. Uh, and so as you look ahead to the new season, um, you mentioned there that at some point you think Burnley will be relegated. It ain't going to happen over the next season, I don't think, because uh, I thought that uh, it was another solid season, good performance. Uh, and you, again, as I say, you just can't imagine Sean Dyche not having his team up uh, for the forthcoming campaign. I mean, they're going to be fit. They're going to be well drilled. You know, he's, he's working on bringing a few new faces in. It's you know, it's in the media. We're linked with a few a few players. Um, again, the, the old style of Burnley, bringing them up from the Championship, some of the better ones from the Championship, and then embedding them within a, a, an established Premiership side, um, which he's done many many times over. Um, you know, I've seen a few pictures and a few things from the training. They do look raring to go. They, they finished the season incredibly well after lockdown. They did amazingly well when you look at the performances then. Um, so I think we'll be well up for it um, when it when it starts. I mean, unfortunately, our first game has been cancelled against United. Um, and it's not the easiest of starts that we've got. But but then again, in the Premiership, when's it ever easier? Yeah. Uh, and what are you expecting? What's your anticipation? Well, it's interesting. The club always remain incredibly grounded, and you know the official line from the club is, you know, we want to finish one place above relegation. That's the official line. Personally, I think they'll finish somewhere around between twelfth and tenth. 
which will be another solid season for us. I, I don't think we'll ever really flirt with relegation. I think we'll always have a, a, a decent gap between us and the bottom three. Um, you know, And again, when you look at the bottom three, you've always got to look at the ones who came up from last season as, as, as ones who will probably struggle. Um, so I think you know Burnley will, will, as you've said, I don't think we'll flirt with relegation next year. I think we'll be mid-table and you know, hopefully have a good season and upset a few along the way. Yeah. And have you still got the interest, excitement around the cup competitions? Because, you know, there is a school of thought now, isn't there, that, you know, it's all about the Premier League and the FA Cup and the League Cup don't much matter. Unfortunately, we very much fall into that camp. Uh, one thing I would say about Sean and Burnley since he's been there is our cup record is absolutely woeful. Um, you know, over recent times as a Premiership club, we've been knocked out by non-league clubs at home. You know, I think the only cup game we've won in in probably the last four or five years we beat Peterborough in the FA Cup, but then got knocked out in the next round. So it's not a, a competition that we take at all seriously. As much as a club like Burnley can, he always he always rotates the squad. Um, so I would love to win a cup or win anything. It'd be great. Great, but I, just by the the fact that the the focus is so much on remaining in the Premiership, I, I just don't think that will happen for us, unfortunately. Okay, and, and as you look at this uh, new season starting, can you see anything beyond City and Liverpool in terms of winners? No, I think I think the winners will be from those two. I think City will come again. I think they'll be much stronger um, than they were last year. I think Liverpool just blew them away and I think they'd almost given up um, when the gap became too big. I think Liverpool, again, looking really, really strong. I mean, I think United, Manchester United, I think they're they're light years behind at the moment. I don't think they'll get anywhere near. Um, they, just can't, they just can't seem to generate the consistency of, of City and certainly Liverpool. So I think it'll be one of those two. If I had to bet, and you're not going to like me for this, I think Liverpool might take it again. No, sadly, I'd have to agree with you, Stephen. My my uh, money, again, if I was a better man, would be on then. Um, but before I leave you, um, I'm I'm sort of asking all our guests, what's your fondest memory? The best game, the game that you'd, uh, if you could, relive all over again. What would that be? What would you pick? Be my game would be. Um... And again, it's it's not a Premiership game at all. So it was when we were in the third tier, we got into the playoffs and we played Plymouth Argyle. Um, so Plymouth had finished at 12 points in front of us. They were a much better side and we had a, an abysmal away record and we played at Burnley first in the first leg and we drew nil apiece and we thought that was the chance had gone, but I'd already prepared to go to the away game. So on a Wednesday night, um, we drove all the way down to Plymouth on the on one of the supporters club coaches for, a, for a, a Wednesday night game, I think it was. Plymouth scored first and you were thinking, in. this is not going to be great 20,000 there you know about 1,000 Burnley fans who think this is going to be abysmal and then we had 15 or 20 minutes like I've never seen before we scored two goals before half time and scored a third late into the night and to see three sides of the ground emptying and you know all singing we're going to Wembley it gives me goosebumps even talking about it so it's certainly not you know certainly not beating United away and all these all the European nights that we've had it, it would be that one the Plymouth Argyle night away it was amazing Fantastic. Well, listen, all the very best for the new season. I'm uh, definitely somebody who's got a soft spot for Burnley. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, you know, over the years, uh, I've watched lots of games between Everton and Burnley. I've also been to Turf Moor on occasions when you were in the old first division, I think, uh, the, the, old, the, the championship, yeah. rather. Uh, and, you know, I've uh, I've always enjoyed the time there that there are, uh, as long as you're not on the opposing team, they're a hospital, hospitable bunch. Yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, one of uh, the people that on a political level is a bit of a hero of mine, Alistair Campbell, uh, is a big Clarets fan as well, isn't he? Yeah, he's a massive Clarets fan. In fact, when the club do their own sort of internal commentary on the games, he's often the um, core commentator on them. So yeah, he's, he's still a big, massive fan. You see him in and around the club quite a lot. So he's a huge fan. Brilliant. Stephen, it's been good to talk to you. And you, Frank. Very different sort of subject. And hopefully I'll see you again very soon, mate. Yeah, and good luck to Everton as well, always. Cheers. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you. Bye. You too. Thanks.